Hello and welcome back for another uplifting episode of Derech Eretz. I'm your host, Lauren Jaffe. Leadership and mentoring entails informal communication, which usually takes place face-to-face and over a sustained period of time, between a person who is perceived to have greater relevant knowledge, wisdom or experience, the mentor, and a person who is perceived to have less, the protege. Rabbi David Masunta elaborates further. You know, the Talmud, the Gemara, is the Jewish book of law, but it's full of debates and teachings and sayings. It's unbelievable to go through, and there's such down-to-earth practical advice. One of the things the Talmud says is that there's six responsibilities that a parent has towards a child. Number one, the first obligation is to circumcise a child. You know what that really means? A parent is obligated to give a child an identity. The child knows that he's a Jewish boy and that thousands of years ago a covenant was made with Abraham and this is what we do. Number two, freedom. At 30 days of age, the child is redeemed from a Kohen. Most of us do not fulfill our dreams because we're scared. We're scared of what people will say. We're scared of failure. One of the things that a parent has to instill within a kid one of the things that a boss has to still has to instill with someone who works for him is freedom don't be scared go out and achieve if you think it you can do it if you dream it you can make it happen but some of us we haven't taught our children how to think big how to achieve the third thing that a parent has to do is to teach their child torah is to teach their child a value system you know some people because of the astrological sign see what's right and see what's wrong But according to Jewish belief, nurture plays a major role in the development of a youngster. And it's so important to teach a kid ambition, but to teach a kid integrity, to teach a kid the basic rules of life. When a child knows what is right and what is wrong, when a child is taught to live a black and white life, you are giving the child the necessary ingredients to make the right decisions and not to stumble in the gray areas of life. The fourth thing that a parent has to do for a child is marry them off. After all, we're God's creation. The very first law in the Torah is to get married and to be fruitful and multiply. We're here to bring children into this world. But it doesn't just mean that. Marrying off a child means instilling within a child the sensitivity, the ability to interact with other people. A person cannot be an island, a selfish island that doesn't interact, that doesn't care for other people. A person has to know that it is our responsibility to live in this world, be committed to our ideologies, be committed to our own beliefs, but at the same time, be broad-minded to understand and to listen to someone else's beliefs, and to be able to debate and to listen to another person's point of view. The fifth thing a parent has to do for a child is to teach a child a trade. And that means a parent has to look at each one of their kids and understand the qualities, understand the acumen, understand the talents of the particular child and help the child develop. But sadly we see that the parent dumps on the child what the parent wanted to be. But that's not Jewish thinking. Don't ever deny the child the talents that the child has. And that's what it means to teach a child a trade. And finally, the sixth thing that a parent has to do for a child is to teach a child how to swim. Simply, of course, to teach a child how to swim will save his life. In fact, in Jewish law, you're not allowed to have a home with any dangerous place that's not fenced in. But what does it mean to teach a child to swim? I think on a deeper level, what it really means is that as a person goes through the journey of life, it's not always going to be easy. There are times that it's going to be tough. There are times that a person is going to feel that they're drowning. Well, if you're drowning, learn to swim underwater. But if you keep focused and you keep swimming, ultimately, the waters will split. And I think that's what it means to teach a child to swim. I think what the Talmud is teaching us, that in life we mustn't be selfish people. We must be mentors. Mentors to our own children. Mentors to every single person we come in contact with. Now in Jewish thinking, nothing happens by chance. Everything happens with absolute divine providence. Now if you look around the country at the moment, there are so many people who need mentorship. There are millions of people living in squalor. There are many who are uneducated. Well, you can look at the problem or you can be part of the solution. If God has placed us in a country where there is so much opportunity to mentor, to teach, to uplift, 
to provide a living for, well, that's what we're here for. So I think in a nutshell, let's all look at ourselves as mentors, not in an arrogant manner, but if there's someone there who needs help, let's have the empathy, let's use our skills, let's use our experience, let's use our talent to go out and educate and uplift them, that they too can become mentors to others. Indoni Dance Arts and Leadership Academy aims to provide an academy of excellence for dance and integrated arts, based primarily in the culturally rich townships. It is a contemporary African-centered approach honoring the heritage of South Africa. We took a trip and spent some time at this unique school. In 2015, we started Indoni Dance Arts and Leadership Academy. And we had a situation where we needed sponsors quickly. So I woke up one morning and I, I went, I've got it. I started something called the BMI Initiative, Benefactor Mentor Investor. So we have people who sponsor, then we have people who mentor, then there are people who do both. So what we really were building was um, an Ubuntu network, a, a network where it's not just about money, it's about humanity. My passion for dancing, I think it's something that I was born with. It comes all the way from childhood and everybody around my area where I come from, Durban, they knew me as this entertainer. So when I was growing older, I decided, okay, I need to pursue this as a career. But I just love to work with young people. If I could remember from the first year, it was, I didn't have confidence, I don't want to lie. I used to be comfortable only when we're doing group work and I would like be at the back, but now like, I'm confident, I, I even did my solo work uh, this year and I won the second place. It's a classroom-based training and on-the-job training. So the classroom-based is the visual art. They have singing with uh, Zin Ziswa, and then they have dancing, different kinds. They also have ballet, they have um, arts management. And we do uh, on-the-job training is performances, internship in the Indoni company, and outreach teaching. I was the one who had no visions and uh, I didn't have a trust on myself. But now like I'm able like to create my own dance piece and now I'm able like to know what I really want in life. In my community uh, like I'm a professional dancer and uh, even if they want some help, they can call me and I'm able like to assist them and yeah, so it has changed me in many ways. On Wednesdays they have a wellness day and they do yoga and they have uh, counselling and they go on field trips, they, they go to performances, they go to galleries, um, they've, had, they've had exposure to things they would never have had an opportunity to know about. So the wellness programme has been very um, First of all, it's very rewarding because we're working with health and goodness and love and all the qualities that one doesn't think about when you're worrying about the trauma and rapes and robberies and burglaries and attacks which happen all the time. So what I've realized with the wellness program is that we were damage controlling all the time. So it's not just being absolute victims um, and sitting like sitting ducks lambs to the slaughter every day, we can think, okay, all right, so if you put your phone, where could you put your phone when you're traveling on the public transport that you could minimize the chance of it getting stolen? So if it's in your back pocket, obviously that's going to be, you know. So those are the things that we've realized that wellness is critical in terms of the part of the management of the whole organization. Um, a wellness program, it, it, it helped me a lot. It helped me to deal with certain situations. Um, things that I'm facing back at home, things about myself, to accept myself the way I am. It brought self-confidence within me to communicate much better, to deal with things, to express my emotions, to express my feelings. Whenever like, I'm in anger, I have to express myself and letting go a lot of things that um, I have bottled up. It, it told me that it's good to cry. It's good to deal with things that you actually not 
not being able to, to, to deal with. It just helped me a lot. Because we've created an environment for them to express themselves verbally, it is actually translating also into their art and into their movement and into their dancing. In fact, Spo told me that. She said um, they're actually dancing with even more feeling and passion and emotion because that's all being unleashed and tethered and harnessed in a way that's safe for them. It's a, just an amazing experience to be around them. They restore my faith in humanity. Leadership is a huge part of this program because it's about confidence building. It's about taking away those um, limiting self-beliefs that kids who come from disadvantaged backgrounds sometimes have. So um, leadership takes so many forms and this program really encourages kids to reach out and be the best version of themselves. I'm given responsibilities that I have to do, then yeah, then that's how I've, I've gained my, my leadership skills. Because I have practical things that I have to do that I know, okay, this I have to do. And I also teach kids at my community in Langa. So I use whatever Mums is teaching me and I also add it as I'm evaluating, okay, how can I take this and bring it back and all that. The mentors are really um, there for cross-cultural and intergenerational communication. So it's really an opportunity for adults to get to know these kids, to guide them, to come to the performances, to help with their networks, they help to publicize the performances, they come and watch the kids dance. Uh, different mentors do different amounts. Some come every single week and visit their mentee, others WhatsApp them. Uh, so the relationship is different and it has to be built with the, the mentor and the mentee. Mum Nontlantla, I just recently knew that she's my mentor and she's a strong woman that I find myself so comfortable that I find another mother. A mother that I could actually just talk, talk with. A mother that she makes me feel comfortable. She told me that I should not settle for less. I should do whatever my heart wants to do. I should follow my heart and be the person that I am. I should not let any man to be there for me to do things. I should be able to do things by myself. If they do anything that they are passionate about, they'll be able to commit and they will find happiness. And when you're happy, we know that it extends to other areas of life. Then you'll be confident, then you'll be more productive, then you'll be more emotionally balanced. So it is very important to translate things that young people have passion in to be used as their means of living and translated into tangible or services that can be traded on for financial gain as well. It's like working on a garden with a flower that just won't open. And yet you can see in between the petals the little bits of budding that's happening that this is an amazing flower. So what it taught me is that every young person has an entry point which is very unique to the person. But once the process of opening up, of that bloom starting to open, there's nothing more satisfying, more thrilling, and more engaging than that. I want to give back to my community because it's rare to find dancing and the kind of a dance that we are doing, African contemporary, it's rare to find it in our communities. So creating some, some change, like giving them the opportunities to perform with us on stage, on theatres, like even now I'm teaching on Saturdays. So yeah, some of them, they have that uh, feeling of uh, dancing with a professional so I think it's better for me like to give back to the community with what I have. What I think the company has done for these people you know when everything is damp around you you get surrounded by dampness so now for by them being here there's a bit of light you know what I mean we're sharing our skills with the young people that are students here. So they actually 
we have enabled, um, given them an opportunity to actually look inside them and say, hey, I was born with this kind of a talent. I know I also love dance, but that's not exactly what I want. I want to branch through. So now they can actually think for future and pursue future in their own like bright thoughts. The sustainability of Indonesia is what's the most astonishing thing for me. Everybody who's been involved and the students themselves. It's not a quick fix or a little short term something. The vision is to grow and become a really solid, stable institution for the art and for, for living. The dairy areas of Indoni would be, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, would be investing in our youth. Investing in South Africa, investing in our youth and investing in South Africa because half the country is in poverty and most are black youth. So I would say that the dairy areas would be investing in our youth using an Ubuntu approach that I am because we are, that we are, we are because of the other and we're all affected if things are not working. We're all affected if things are working. Dr. Linda Cantor is a counselling psychologist, hypnotherapist and yoga teacher based in Cape Town. Linda is also the co-founder and partner of the Cape Town mindfulness-based stress reduction program, which has been running since 1999 as part of the University of Cape Town Graduate School of Business, where she teaches mindful leadership on the executive MBA program. I believe that my Jewish faith plays a very deep role in my connection to mindfulness, um, mostly through the story of my mother. So my mother is a survivor from Rhodos Island in Greece, and uh, she's one of 42 people that actually survived from the Shoah. And I feel that I was very deeply impacted by her story and by my grandparents' story and I was always kind of questioning what is available to allow us as human beings to live a life that's more compassionate, that's more aware, that is not violent and uh, so part of that quest, part of that search brought me into the, the practices of meditation and the practice of mindfulness. So mindful yoga is one of the practices of mindfulness so there are, there are a few different ways that people can learn mindfulness. They can learn it through sitting meditation, they can learn it through lying down and just scanning through their body, but they can also learn it through moving mindfully. Not about getting into a complicated posture or you know because there's a lot of misperceptions about yoga, but it's really about what the essence of yoga is which is about stilling the mind, um, being in our bodies in a, in a self-accepting and kind way and um, bringing curiosity to the miracle of what the body can do. So mindful yoga is just a way of starting to allow people to explore that for themselves. So mindful coaching and psychotherapy is a combination of bringing mindfulness into coaching and psychotherapy. So for example, with my clients, I will often teach them meditative practices as part of their process. And we use the practices to help turn towards the uncomfortable things, um, the uncomfortable feelings, and not to have to kind of uh, do anything about it, but rather just to learn to befriend ourselves exactly as we are. And that's a little bit paradoxical because very often people want to come to change something. And But, but uh, funnily enough, as people bring self-acceptance to themselves, things naturally start to unfold in a, in a different way. So it's this wonderful way of just being able to weave in the beauty and the gift of the present moment, um, but also to help, help kind of piece together um, their backgrounds and their conditioning and for us to kind of see the story in a different way. The UCT uh, Mindfulness Leadership Program is a program that's so dear to my heart. 
Um, about 12 years ago, I was invited to teach on the Executive MBA program. And it's a really groundbreaking program in that it's compulsory for the students to do the mindful leadership component, even though they might initially resist it. Um, and around the world, there's not many programs, MBA programs, that allow that. Um, kind of enforce that they do this and so um, it's been a wonderful exploration for me over the last 12 years as I've developed a way of kind of being with them over their two-year journey and believe you me they have a very stressful time it's a highly driven highly competitive program um, people are there because they want to do more and achieve more in their lives um, but funnily enough, the approach of the program and all the lectures in the program is different in that we're interested not only in their business skills, but in who they are as human beings. And certainly with mindful leadership, my intentionality with them is to bring humanity back into business so that they are more connected. I often say to my students, you're going to take one of the hardest journeys in this class, which is the journey from your head to your heart. Um, so it can be challenging for them, but it's a, it's a wonderful way of being able to teach them to, to still, to pause, to manage their stress differently um, because, for example, if a leader is very stressed and very reactive, they might make decisions that are not the best decisions to make. So, you know, by starting to notice things like that, they can start to approach uh, their business lives and also their home lives in a different way, in a less reactive, more creative way, and maybe an even more, a more compassionate way. I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that, you know, through these practices, there is actually so much hope um, because I actually have the privilege of watching them change over two years and watching them become far more connected to their hearts, far more socially um, conscious and wanting to contribute to their communities and to their societies. So I think I've I've learned so much and I continue to be challenged and I continue to learn. In actual fact, my PhD was, was around you know, interviewing a, a large number of those students and hearing their stories. Um, and you know, aside from sometimes it's really challenging, um, I heard stories about people being more willing to speak truth to power um, and particularly um, with their employees being able to understand power in a different way, to focus more on relationality and care and compassion in the workplace. Um, so I had some really interesting stories from many of the students that they, they were sharing with me. My Derek Eretz is to be able to set that intention for myself every day to remember my own goodness and to live with kindness and with compassion and you know hopefully to bring some positivity into the space around me and then I have the blessing of being able to encourage others to do the same so when we speak about leadership I think that we're all leaders in whatever situation we're in whether we lead a family or we're a leader in a group of friends or we're a leader in a community and so you know I get the opportunity in my life to explore that for myself and to share that with others in, in very many ways. Former UK Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli once said, the greatest good you can do for another is not just to share your riches, but to reveal to him his own. From me, Lauren Jaffe and the Derek Eretz team, remember you too can be a part of the conversation.